I felt, and I wanted to share them with you, and most importantly, to invite you to consider, is this meaningful to you? I don't mean a specific incident, but I mean the Dharma implications of it. What about in your own life? Is it familiar? Do you know of it? Has it touched you? To inquire, so this isn't just me talking, but really an invitation for you to inquire into your own understanding. Um, so when I recently visited, I said India, when I was leaving, um, I was being, I was driven, I and another person were being driven to the airport in Mumbai um, by, by an Indian driver, uh, and it was a, quite a long car ride. Uh, as we were driving, our, tech, our, ca our car got kind of snarled in traffic in one of the smaller cities that we went through. And we had stopped for a while, a little while, and a elderly man, a beggar, came up to the car on the opposite side, the window where this other passenger was sitting, knocked on the window, there was air conditioning in the car, he knocked on the window, and he did this, he put his fingers to his lips, asking for food and money. <clears throat> now, I mean, you perhaps have heard and certainly repeated over and over, is the advice, <clears throat> don't feed beggars, don't give them money. Why? Because you will encourage them uh, to beg, you don't know what they're going to do with the money, and the Indians actually prefer you not feed, feed them when, if, if you encounter a beggar. Now, in fact, I hadn't yet. This was the first time during this trip that someone came up and begged while I was right there. And I turned to this other passenger. He was a man <clears throat> who was an Australian, an old Indian hand. He lived, he and his wife lived in India half the time of the year and then back in Australia for the other half of the time. And I turned to him and I said, so what should we do? Um, I knew I'd heard the advice, but I don't know, maybe he had a different thought. <clears throat> and he said, don't give him money. He said, Look, we won't get, let's not give him money. He said, you never know what he's going to do with it. And it's pretty standard. And what I did was I leaned back. I did not give him money. And the man moved on. The car moved on. But my mind stayed right there and kept moving around this whole thing about giving money. Should I have given him some money? And I played and replayed this scenario in my mind. <coughs> And I felt pretty bad about it, actually. And I felt, you know, I wish I had just reached into my purse, pulled out 50 or 100 rupees, which is not a lot of money, by the way. That's very little, or even more. And just told Bill, the man sitting next to me, why don't you turn down the window and just handed it to the man. <clears throat> I realized I really wished my reaction would have been to be compassionate, as I would have preferred. And my mind went on around that, and then it went on to criticize me. Like, why didn't I do that? You know, this is really what I wanted to do. And then into the, oh my goodness, you know, I'm so spineless. I'm a noodle, was the word that I used for myself. You know, just capitulating under the uh, uh, standard advice. I did, so I didn't do it. Um, and I think that all of us here who have heard even maybe one Dharma talk have heard about running on mind, about the critical mind. <clears throat> and the many, many mm, problems with a mind that runs on and is self-critical. Mental proliferation, we could call it, the thoughts that go on and on and on. Uh, they judge. And what's the problem with judging? A judging mind doesn't let one see clearly or truly what's happening in the present moment. It's too caught up in judgment. Oh, thank you, Jeff. <clears throat> it's too caught up <clears throat> in judgment. It can't see. It's behind a, just a veil of self-criticism. It doesn't allow you 
to be compassionate in the present moment. No matter what you happened in the past, you can't be compassionate. You're too caught up in what you should have done, the should have. <clears throat> and so the problem with a repetitive, self-critical self thinking is it colors reality. It prevents you from seeing what really is. And it prevents us from being who we really are. We talk about it all the time here at IMCC. And I think we all know that this kind of self-critical thinking repetitively is the product of the ego and it reinforces the ego. The ego says, oh goody, he bought it or she bought it, the story. You know, and this is, boy, this is just what the ego wants for you to buy into it and it solidifies the role of the ego. You need to listen to it. Ah, yes, it's telling me I'm terrible or I should have done what I didn't do. <clears throat> the ego tells us stories and it also, I will say, subverts the very purpose of what our spiritual path is about. Because the spiritual path is about awakening, it's about freedom. It's not being caught up in, it's not about being caught up in self-judgment. It's about beginning to free ourselves from some of that. So my story, of course, I think it's obvious where I was on that. I was caught up. And yet at the same time, I will have to say, not irrevocably caught up. I knew, you know, I could begin to let this go. You know, I, saw, I could see what I was doing and the way I was criticizing myself. But we all know, I think we've all heard, the mind has a negativity bias, right? We've heard this before. It automatically kind of runs into the negative to threat and to what's wrong. It's just a inbred in the species, maybe in all species actually, but certainly in our species. Okay, I didn't buy it fully and utterly. I understood, you know, I'm not always a noodle. You know, I don't always do that. But that time, indeed, I was. But I will say that as pr practitioners of mindfulness and compassion, I think that we buy into ideals. We hold a certain ideal, namely, that, man, I'm supposed to always be compassionate and clear and mindful and peaceful. That's the supposed to be. That's the way it is supposed to be. And I would like to take this little commentary one step further and say, um, I think we think the same thing about our meditation. Supposed to be calm. It's supposed to be equanimous. And we can say, I've had a terrible meditation. Not calm, not equanimous, you know, are criticizing our actions. Not calm, not equanimous, not, not wise, such as I criticize mine. I will suggest, and this again going a step Further, we're not seeing deeply enough. We aren't seeing deeply enough. You know, our life may be falling apart, but sometimes it, all lives fall apart. Uh, I came across a beautiful comment, or apt comment by Shanti Deva, uh, ancient master. He said, have you been scorched by life? I think we've all been scorched at times. But what do we do ordinarily as good meditators and as good practitioners? We think we're supposed to be equanimous even while we're being scorched. Well, it doesn't work like that. Hmm? It doesn't really work like that. Instead of being self-critical about our actions, our, our failings, quote unquote, of our meditation, we need to learn acceptance. I think a deeper lesson is acceptance, that we, you, each one of us, is a human being. And life has its ups, it has its downs. And there are going to be times when we do not live up to ideals. And in fact, living up to an ideal is a problem. We're supposed to be with things as they really are. And so being with things as they really are, which means like, hey, I'm feeling terrible. I'm criticizing myself, or I'm whatever I am happens to be in the moment. We need to learn to grow bigger, to step back and accept what's true in the moment. That's the deeper equanimity, what in fact is true in the moment. So acceptance or surrender, does that make sense? Acceptance and surrender. Um, you see, at the heart of the problem when we buy into our stories is the ego. 
the ego wants control. The ego, our ego, wants to impose some sort of order on this chaotic life that exists. And it will keep at us, telling us, in order to do that, we need to really work and be equanimous. And of course we want to do that. I'm saying that we need to get more subtle and at the same time realize we're not going to always succeed. Because we've not to, we need to kind of tie in and become alert to the function of the ego. It wants to control what we're doing and tells us it's got to be an impose kind of an order, make life pleasant. We're supposed to be able to switch on, and this is what we try to do, an equanimous mind when we meditate. Meditation becomes a way, can become a way, of making life easier to bear, of removing suffering. Now, in fact, it does happen like that sometimes, right? I think we've all find, found that out. But to make that the point of why we meditate is not big enough. We can meditate for a bigger reason, and that is the waking up. So the ego is right in there, and its function is, oh, I'm going to make life easier for us. And in fact, it gets right in the way. The ego is in the way because, in fact, this is all about seeing through the ego stories. So actually, what I would like to ask you, um, I think all of us, I'm going to ask you to think of a moment when your mind was critical, self-critical, remembering maybe something recently happened, calling it to mind for a moment. Not my story, your story. then I ask, invite you to ask yourself, can you see how that was a manufactured story, a self-centered story, your self-criticism? The criticism may be right. I mean, maybe you did something that wasn't good, right? Maybe you did something that, but the repetitive going around and around and around on the same story, can you see how you're buying in and inflating that story? how you're buying into the ego and what it wants to do. It's blaming you for not being equanimous, for not having a calm mind or not doing it right, not saying clearly, whatever it is you're not doing, you're not doing it. That's the ego and it wants to make it big. It wants to make it big. Can you see also, if you can see that this is the ego at work, that you have a choice. You have a choice not to buy into the story. You have a choice to drop the repetitiveness of the self-criticism. Can you see that for yourself? Does that make sense? I invite you to think about it. Learning when is it time when you catch yourself doing it, when's it time to drop it? When's it too much? When is it simply the ego manufacturing stuff and say, yippee, they're believing it, going along with me. Okay, so that's story number one, the first story. I'm going to tell you a second story. This happened a little bit after the story with the beggar. In fact, uh, it was when um, I landed in Amsterdam. The pl I had been already been traveling quite a long time, uh, several hours in fact. It was an eight and a half hour flight to get to Amsterdam and several hours in India before that, a long car ride, um, like seven hour car ride to get to the airport and then other things, so it was long. I was getting, I was sick because on the car ride, our driver had bronchitis and he was coughing those seven hours. So by the time I got out of the car, I was at the airport in Mumbai and I was coughing. And so by the time I got to Amsterdam, I was really sick. Moreover, I didn't sleep well on the plane that eight and a half hours and I was just generally pretty miserable. So uh, we arrived, I guess it was around six in the morning. I kind of lost track, but whatever it was, my body wasn't with it. Uh, there was a, a Dutch uh, airport official standing there offering directions for where people 
should go. And I walked up to him. I wanted to know where I had another flight to catch, a transatlantic flight to catch. Where should I go? And I came up to him, and, and I asked him. And he looked at me, and he was silent. And then he said, good morning. And when he said, good morning, in that moment, everything dropped with, for me. The fact that I was feeling miserable, the fact that I was sleepy, the fact that I needed to get someplace, all of that just dropped. There was just silence in that moment. It was like a um, little earthquake had happened in my life. And all the baggage I was carrying, suddenly he cut right through it. In retrospect, I thought, you know what? He was acted like a Zen master would act. And I will tell you, I've studied, I was in Zen several years before I was in, in this tradition. And um, actually one of the, the earliest Zen teacher I had was a Korean teacher. And indeed, he, they, a Zen master traditionally used something called a kiyosaku. A kiyosaku is a long, thin stick, about maybe three inches wide, flex, kind of flexible. And what they typically would do is um, when the students are meditating, they would hit a student on the shoulder right there to kind of jolt them. And it's not only to wake up a sleeping student, although that happened, but it was to jolt them into another level of reality, another level of consciousness, right there. And I thought, this man's, ki this man's good morning was like a kiyosaku, totally unexpected. I would not have, in a mo for a moment, I didn't expect it. And that's the thing about this kiyosaku. It comes unexpected, and all of a sudden, something flips. And that's what happened for me in that moment. So I looked at him, and I smiled. And it was a smile that I will remember. It, it wasn't a Susan smile. It came from some, some other place, from some other level of consciousness. I can't even put words to it, but I can feel it. And I just said, good morning. And did he notice? Well, I think he did. What he did is he kind of looked down, and he had a small kind of I won't, uh, private smile on his lips. You know, it's just mm, like that. Now, I don't know that this man was a Zen master. I'm not saying he was. He probably thought, oh, here's another pushy American, you know, when I came up, when I came up to him. Maybe that's what he thought. But the effect of what he said was just that. And so I said good morning, smiled, said good morning to him. And then he had that smile. And then he turned around. He, turned around and he gave me the instruction. I thanked him and I walked away. But the moment was just a moment that was truly exceptional. A moment that was out of time. It was timeless. A memorable moment. Right there in the midst of the Amsterdam airport with people going back and forth and the announcements on the PA system, whatever system. Right there, a timeless moment. You see, these things can happen anywhere, not to be in India. And in fact, I had been in India. I was at a pilgrimage retreat center in India. And I thought, wow, you know, you have to be in a pilgrimage retreat center in India. Like, wow, how a wonderful uh, a retreat center in India. No, they're right there in the Amsterdam airport. It was very special. Um, so what I would like to ask you is I would invite you to think for a moment and inquire, have you ever experienced a moment that was outside of time, a moment that was so special? It not the moment I'm, however you would define it, however you experienced it, have you? Thinking about it for a moment, maybe it have. And maybe not. If you have, or first of all, say if you haven't, not to worry. Not to worry. Time will come. Very likely you will. If you keep on with practice, believe me, 
you're going to be prone to such moments. It'll happen. But if you have, if you have, what was the quality of that moment? Can you think back and remember? What was the quality of that moment for you? And in view of the story I've just told, do you perhaps maybe see more into it than you did at the time? Maybe at the time you thought, wow, something special and kind of moved on. Can you stop for a moment and really consider it? What was the quality of that moment for you? And again, this is about your life, your practice. Honoring what you have experienced and seeing it for what it is. And not being discouraged if you haven't experienced it, because it can come at any unexpected time. And so then I'd like to move on to the th a third story, again, leaving India. Um, you know, the Buddha spoke and said, old age, sickness, and death are the source of suffering. And I experienced, I guess you would say both, I would say both sickness and old age. I am aging. Um, I'm 76, I'm not young. And both of them came together when I got home. And I had bronchitis and pneumonia and was in bed for two weeks, basically. It was really interesting two weeks. This was not horrible. This was so amazing. For one thing, it kind of gave me some time to arrive back without having to flip into life as usual. So that was good. But the, really the deeper reason that it was good was because I noticed something. I noticed that I kept thinking, you know, my body doesn't do this. This is so unusual. I mean, I haven't ever had pneumonia before. I've never had bronchitis like that before. Uh, wow. And then I got thinking, you know, this really, this isn't me. <laughs> and then I was going on, well, what's me? Well, me is this pretty healthy person who's high energy and, you know, is doing lots of stuff and doesn't know what the heck pneumonia is and on meds that I've never taken. I don't like taking medication. And here I was on stuff that I didn't like at all. Um, you know, not me. And then I began to realize, and it pushed me to realize, well, wait a minute. What in fact, you know, what in fact is me? What is any me on any, at any given time? And it made me realize, you know, in our practice, what we do is we train ourselves to notice physical sensations. What are, and to drop the story around them. What's the physical sensation I'm experiencing now? And we can do that and become pretty good at it. But I will suggest that at some point, it's hard, especially if you have repetitively the same physical sensations, and I more or less have a healthy body going along doing good stuff. It's hard not at some point to self-identify with that. Ah, that's me. You know, that the me is healthy. Well, this was a right in my face example of, wait a minute, this is me in this moment. It was showing me something, in fact, about the fallacy of saying and identifying any identity with self, what is self. Identifying with oneself, healthy or unhealthy, whatever it may be. It's like mm, shifting sand. It's like wind blowing over water. That's what we are as a self. It's forever changing. Even if you are fortunate enough to go through several years, many, when which you've been relatively healthy, as I have. No, that's not me either. Just being present, recognizing, yep, it's going to be natural to tie, kick in and think, okay, this is me. And it's also, we can recognize that's wrong. 
the self is always changing. There isn't one, as the Buddha said. In fact, there's a quote by an ancient, by not ancient, 20th century Zen master, he was Irish, um, that we've quoted before, and he said, why are you unhappy? Because 99.4% of everything you think and everything you do is for yourself, and there isn't one. There's no self. We can say that, that there is no self. I mean, heavens, we've been saying that here for how many years, as long as we've been getting together. But the question is, and that's the question I will ask you, have you had insight into that? So that's what I would like to invite you right now to inquire and notice, have you had insight for yourself in your own life into the fact there really isn't one, no self? Have you seen how it's just all impermanent, it's all changing? Inquire into that, I invite you for a moment. I will say that I'm seeing that aging is a wonderful, wonderful teacher. It is a teacher that can show you many things. First of all, we're in a society that really pretty much reviles aging. We don't like it. Um, as I was thinking about this, uh, a moment occurred to me in a movie I saw some years ago, I was in a movie theater, and in it the heroine was a beautiful young woman. But then the story evolves and it shows her as an, a lovely older woman. And there is a moment in the film where it flashes on her body, she was a naked body. And in the theater there was a groan. Ew! It was memorable how we feel about aging. It's ew. And industry has made billions of dollars on that ew, hasn't it? We've got all kinds of industries, plastic surgeons, cosmetics, clothes, well, you name it. We've got an industry to help staunch the flow of age, right? Well, I will say, as you get older, and some of you have a long way to go yet, but we're all getting there if we're lucky. Recognize the lesson of aging. One of the lessons of aging, I'll say, of course, is appreciating the moments more intensely than you have before. Maybe because there are fewer of them to come in the natural course of things. There's a, a lovely article by, um, what's her name, about being 80. Mm. I just forgot, from out of Spirit Rock, the 80-year-old grandmother. Sylvia Borstein. Sylvia Borstein, thank you. She just has an article in uh, Lion's Roar, one of the quarterly periodicals, Buddhist quarterly periodicals, talking about appreciating things. Everything becomes more precious at 80. So that's one of the gifts of aging. But as what I'm telling you right now is really another gift that really struck me during this experience of being really sick, and that is realizing, whoa, again, it's not like it's the first time, but realizing how aging and sickness can push you into recognizing there's no self. So that is the suggestion, and asking you to investigate that for yourself. 
So this is Dharma in the everyday life, is what I've been talking about. Three incidents. And the first incident was um, the self-criticism. And part of the teaching is accepting acceptance, not just saying self-criticism, we don't want it, which we need to be aware of it, but accepting what is true when it is, when it is true, not just resisting it, not just resisting. That's the first story and I think outcome of that story. And the second one, in the airport at Amsterdam, a moment that was outside of time when everything dropped, which all of us can experience because it's always there. In fact, I invited you, if you may remember in meditation this evening, to ask you, invite you, to step into background awareness for a moment. And maybe some of you were able to do that. We, our attention is on the foreground, our body, our whatever, our breath, whatever. But background awareness, that place of utter silence, it's always there. And this last one, aging, sickness, and impermanence and no self. Lessons we can directly realize from those experiences. And if you haven't realized these things, please do not be discouraged. We are all at different places on our spiritual path. That's the nature. That's the way things are. We're all at different places. Spiritual path is a process of maturing. Over years, a lifetime. You know, if you haven't recognized something, don't beat yourself up, just what we were talking about. Oh, that's just where you are. It's important to be honest about just where you are, what, where you are in your spiritual journey. You can't start ahead of yourself or make progress ahead of yourself be where, being where you are. So mm, trusting, trusting that this journey will carry you on because it does. An open heart, listening as truly and honestly as you can, even when you encounter that stuff about yourself you don't like. So listening. I'd like to conclude with a poem from Rumi, uh, a Sufi poet. And I, it is a poem that realize, really summarizes in, in many ways, in a poetic way, the three the themes I've been talking about tonight. I'm going to ask you to listen to it. Don't try to understand. Just let it flow over you. Just let it flow. And he said, the minute I'm disappointed, I feel encouraged. When I'm ruined, I'm healed. When I'm quiet and solid as the ground, I talk the low tones of thunder for everyone. The minute I'm disappointed, I feel encouraged. When I'm ruined, I'm healed. When I'm quiet and solid as the ground, I talk the low tones of thunder for everyone. Thank you for listening.